Okay, what I'm working on right now, I've got a holster piece already cut out here on the table, and then I decided, yeah, I should probably go ahead and film this because I haven't done this particular holster yet. Um, I have done cross draw holsters, but this is going to be a cross draw holster with a regular fixed belt loop, kind of the old fashioned style of it, uh, as opposed to the more modern pancake style that I've done on video far. Um, Experienced holster makers probably can look at this right away and go, oh yeah, that's a cross-draw holster probably for a revolver just by looking at the shape of it. But if you didn't get all that just by looking at it, uh, what we've got going on here is the shape with the wide part for the cylinder for a revolver is a kind of a telltale. Um, and then when the part that becomes the belt loop that folds over curves inward like this it's going to be for a cross draw if it curves outward then it tilts the angle of the holster instead of tilting it um, like this on the belt imagine the belt going through here if you tilt it outward it's going to tilt it the other way on the belt so you're going to have like the sights be down and that'll be like for a strong side draw with a real uh, with it angled back for like a quick draw type situation or for behind the back carry some people prefer that but it all focuses around this center fold line and where that's going to fold back on itself and in this case i had this curve in it so i went ahead and added the same curve onto the the loop on both sides to give it kind of a more graceful appearance and when this is folded back you don't have a piece you know, sticking out here that you can see. Uh, so all beef said and done, uh, it'll be nice and neat and clean. But anyway, that's where we're at. Um, I'm going to start going ahead and putting this together. Probably one of the earliest steps on it. I'm going to do, of course, all my usual uh, stitching grooves and so on. But this is a customer that's a regular customer of mine had made knife sheets and holsters and several things for him and he always wants me to put grim reapers on them which i'm not entirely sure about but this grim reaper that i put on a knife sheath farm should fit just fine on this holster and it's one that he likes so we're going to go with carving that on here there's already a video on the channel of doing that um, i'll probably link a card for that for y'all rather than take the time to show you what's going on here. let's go ahead and do some edge beveling now this piece is six to seven ounce leather that's going to be lined with a piece of about four ounce leather. So it should be a nice heavy holster being 10 to 11 ounces total, which is good for a big revolver. This is for a Smith and Wesson 686 that is a, has a seven shot cylinder in it. So it's a little bit bigger than normal, uh, but not really that much. Um, surprisingly, the tracing for it seems to fit the same tracing for most medium size or medium frame revolvers. And I have a blue gun that's actually for a Ruger GP144. Um, what says 44 Special, so not really 44 Magnum, but same general idea. And it fits the tracing really well, and will probably fit this holster. So anybody that has a 686 or a GP100. This holster may work out for him just fine. Um, if you're doing everything by hand, lining a holster like this, while definitely makes a better holster, adds a lot of extra time to the project. Uh, but with the sewing machine, you just run right around it real quick. It takes a few minutes. I did not. Now that we've got all that, I know what space I have to play with for the carving. I can go ahead and do that, get it carved, get the background done on it, and then I can start coloring it up. This holster is going to be black with some color for the, the Grim Reaper. So I wasn't really counting, maybe an hour, hour and a half. I've got it all carved up. Got background and a border stamp, and of course a little Grim Reaper dude in there. Uh, before anybody really asks, this background that I'm using with these skulls is not something that's readily available. It's a one-of-a-kind stamp that I took a Dremel tool 
uh, to an old pear shader. It's a P224, it looks like, saddle restamp. So it was a big, huge pear shader. And I ground it away and ground a little skull on it to make these little skull impressions. Pretty much just for backgrounds on stuff I make for this guy. Uh, but yeah, so that's a custom tool. I think I made a video of doing that as well. Uh, All right, go ahead and color this. Uh, during different parts of this process, I'm going to use a little bit of everything. So I'm going to start with acrylic paints. I'm going to use dyes, or at least a black dye for a lot of it. And I'm going to use a black antique stain. So basically a little bit of everything to do this. Uh, and there's reasons for each of them. Like certain colors, like white, while there's technically a dye that's sold as a white dye, it's basically just a thinned down paint. So really, it's just easier to use an acrylic when you're doing white. The problems from this arise in that it always looks a little cartoony unless you do some very complicated paint techniques. But those just aren't necessary as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I'll use the antique stain. Because uh, I'll leave it and let it look a little cartoony at first. When I go over it with the antique stain, it'll bring out any of those little shadows and cut marks and things that I have in the leather. It gets rid of that cartoon look really quick by adding some texture to it. There are other reasons you might use paints instead of stains or dyes in some cases. Um, one of them that comes to mind that I can think of is a lot of times blue and green dyes don't hold up to UV light over time. So if it's something that's going to be outside a lot and see sunlight a lot, a blue dye on it might just fade away and turn, the leather turns darker brown and the blue fades out and you just wind up with a brown color. I've had the same thing happen with green because the primary component of it is blue, that it just kind of turns a brown color. And then bright colors, yellow, white, pink, you know, things like that. The leather itself, since the dyes are translucent, since the color of the leather shows through a little bit, um, instead of being completely opaque, you'll wind up with, um, again, as the leather darkens up over time, bright colors will just kind of turn brown. So things like this white, in order for it to stay white, you really have to use an acrylic paint, but you don't want to just dye the whole thing black and then try to paint it, um, especially not without putting some sort of finish on it first, because black dye will, over time, actually um, bleed through the paint. Like on these white pieces, I don't want black underneath of them because otherwise it'll turn splotchy over time as that black dye works its way up through the paint and out to the surface. Now all that being said, another choice you might think about on some things with paints like this is durability. And over time on something that gets a lot of abrasion, paints will wear away. So, like if you're making a wallet for somebody, and you put something like this on it, that paint may wear off. Okay, now we get to the part where I'm doing something with the dye. I'll be dyeing this whole area with the dauber probably. But in close to all that painting, I want to paint the dye in, and I've got a brush here that I marked with a piece of black tape. And this is one I just use for black dye, because once you use it for black dye, you can't ever really get that dye out of the brush. I've tried washing it and washing it with denatured alcohol and other solvents. And I just decided it's best just to have a black dye brush for doing projects like this. Same can be true. So common, or at least common for me technique that I'll use is I'll start with the brush in an area that I know is going to be black and get most of the excess dye off and then move in towards my areas that I need to be a little bit more careful. Alright, now that I've got the close stuff colored, 
are mostly colored. Um, again, like I said, some of that's going to wait until we get around to the antique stain. If I can go around with a dauber and fill in all the rest of this. Alright, now that everything is black, like I said, I want to use antique stain to knock off this kind of cartoony look that we have here with the scythe and the white so it doesn't stand out quite as much but to keep it from just turning black on that or being really dirty looking I need to have some sort of finish on it so I'm going to use uh, an acrylic called Super Sheen it's sold by Tandy Leather um, and technically since this is all already dyed I could just go over the whole thing with this without any trouble But I would worry a little bit about picking up too much of the black if I do that. So I'm basically just going to go over the areas that I want to resist. But if I get sloppy and get it all over the black stuff, it doesn't matter. So it's really kind of easy on this project. On other things where I'm using a resist like this, I want the antique stain to provide the color for the rest of it. I have to be very careful not to get any of the resist where I don't want it resisted but in this case like I said it doesn't much matter so I'm just gonna... now the the other paints did okay the silver I always seem to pick up a little bit of it with the uh, the super sheen but since this is supposed to be death scythe it doesn't need to be really perfectly pretty and shiny in most cases a little bit of leather showing through is just gonna look like it's got some highlights to it, some rustiness or something going on. And that usually isn't a problem if it doesn't look perfectly shiny. And in this case, for this customer, it's definitely not a problem. He likes that look. That it looks like it's been around a while. But here's the real trick with this particular process. And it's called patience, which is something that everybody has trouble with for the most part that I've noticed. You can let this finish dry until it's dry to the touch and think okay I'm good and then you put your antique stain on there and it's like it's not even got the finish on it it'll still stain all these white parts really mottled black color uh, you have to let it sit not just until it's dry to the touch but you have to let it sit until the acrylic has had a chance to go through a chemical reaction and the pieces of you know the little molecules of acrylic kind of bond together and polymerize a little bit at least that's what I think is going on and it actually cures so dry to the touch isn't good enough you want to let this dry overnight um, like eight ten hours if you can at least okay Sometimes now we get to the messy part the antique stain where I might cause all sorts of trouble things don't work out as planned but this has had a chance to dry it's actually been about 20, well, 22 hours, we'll say. I'm going to put a black antique stain on it real quick. And then take a damp paper towel right away. And wipe off any excess. Now up here, I'm just doing this so that it mostly matches. I don't expect it to really make it any blacker. And as you can see, that eliminates some of that, like I said, sort of cartoon look of just solid colors. Add some shadows. Now, again, gotta let that dry, and then I'll put a clear finish on it. Okay, to prevent smearing any of the antique stained places that I don't want it. I always use a spray finish um, whenever I go over an antique stain, or at least for the most part I always use that. And in this case, it'll also help keep uh, from rubbing off more of the silver. I think I need to get new silver paint. Now that we're to the part where we get to assemble this together, I'm just going to start gluing stuff together. Glue the liner to the holster back. It's been a while since I've made a holster that's this simple to do. Um, as far as assembly goes. I 
Okay, now let's get this started gluing together. You can use some wax paper or something to try and keep it from sticking in places you don't want it to stick yet as you go together. Got some glue on the front there. But I like to start putting it together and actually fold the holster a little bit as I go so that I don't have um, as many creases on the inside and the liner. Of course, if you're not lining it, all of this is completely unnecessary. But I always think a holster is a lot better with the lining in it. Nice smooth leather on the inside. I also want to fold down what's going to be my uh, belt loop to prevent creases and so on. Stretch marks. At least a little bit. But with the leather the way it is, rough cut, that's not going to work. So I'm going to go ahead and grab a knife real quick and split that. Just from here and up so that I can fold my belt loop back a little bit too. I can either go ahead and trim these edges to match or what I prefer to do is I'm going to go downstairs and stitch uh, along the openings on each end of the holster, the mouth of it and the toe of it. I'll leave this part until after I trim it. But I like to get these done because sometimes if you trim it first and you go and stitch it with a machine, your lining leather will it's expand and stretch a little bit as the machine punches through. And then it doesn't line up with the edge as well. Um, or your whole thing, everything starts to shift. Plus it's just a little bit easier to run it through a machine if you've got a wider piece out the side and your uh, machine doesn't want to try and slip off uh, with one of the presser feet. I'm going ahead and punching some holes in all these corners to make it easier to trim this liner off. See, then when I have that brown hole punched in the corner, it's a lot easier to turn that corner without tearing anything up. Right, now, before I go any further really on this, I want to go ahead and start finishing up these edges, especially around what's going to be the belt loop, the top and the toe of the holster where I've got it already sewn. All of that's going to be hard to get to after I get the rest of it sewn together. So I'm going to go ahead and bevel those edges now that they're trimmed. And get them all slick and smooth. Well, dyed because the trim uh, for the uh, lining piece. You can obviously see it needs to be dyed still. But yeah, I'll go over with the black dye and get all that trimmed and smooth and finished up so that when I go to put it together, all I've got left to do is finish this edge that I'm going to still be stitching. And everything's black. It's real easy. I don't have to worry about getting a little bit of a dark color on my front or back because it's all black already well except for the little death dude there 
This is called gum tragacanth, and it's a burnishing compound. It's a plant resin. And you just smear on that edge and you let it soak in, and when it's almost dry is when it's going to work the best to smooth out that piece of leather. One way you can tell when uh, gum tragacanth and a lot of other, other burnishing compounds is working is it starts to feel a little stickier as you're getting friction. You can even hear it. And that's when you get a nice smooth glossy edge. It's better. All right, so I am almost there. I've got to go down, stitch the belt loop. Always remember, stitch the belt loop first. It's really a pain to get to if you stitch this first and then forget your belt loop. And then we'll stitch this together. I'll take to a sander real quick and sand those edges. And then I'll be back up here to finish this up. I almost forgot something. Before I stitch it up, I want to finish punching through these two holes here. This is for... Um, the customer wants a hammer loop on the revolver. Uh, basically, it's just a, a little strip of lace that catches over the hammer and helps hold it in there in rough country. Uh, and it's easiest, of course, to punch these holes out before it's all stitched together. Okay, well, I totally forgot to film uh, stitching it together, but suffice it to say, I just stitched a rectangle on the back here to form the belt loop and then stitched this seam from the bottom back stitched then all the way up and back stitched to finish that seam up so it's just more stitching with that sewing machine that I'm sure a lot of people are jealous of um, and we're going to take some dye to that and then slick it I made this holster fairly lightweight for a heavy revolver like this. Um, it could definitely be a thicker piece of leather that I used as my main piece. But it should work just fine. Um, it'll just be a lighter holster. It'll probably be still stiffer and sturdier than most of what you find that manufacturers have made with a single piece of leather just because it's been lined. And most manufacturers don't use any heavier than um, about 10 ounce leather, which is what this is equivalent to once I've got both the pieces together. But sometimes people want real thick, heavy stuff, and that's when you go to a piece of like 8 to 9 with a 4 to 5 for a liner. There'll be a little bit of fine tuning on the shaping, but for now, as you can see, this revolver will fit just fine in it. So it should fit the customer's revolver because they're not the same, but they're similar. They fit the same profile. Now, the last thing I need to add is that hammer loop I was talking about. And for that, Really simple, I'm just using some lace, just some half inch lace that I keep around. You can use any piece of half inch, about four to five ounce leather, maybe even thinner, about three. A little flexible helps, so maybe chrome tan, but in this case I'm using a vegetable tan lace that's a milled veg tan. And you wanna punch a couple holes about an inch apart or so so that your slit doesn't split out um, you want a round hole at each end otherwise your lace could tear I'll just 
cut from each of those holes. Make a piece of lace like that. And we'll take We'll actually taper it down over a long distance because we can always trim it off. I'm going to take and cut just a little bit here so it looks like I cut off both sides of it, but I didn't. That's really all I need for a hammer loop to secure, to secure a firearm into this holster. Now then, through the top hole, and with a little bit of twisting and turning, you should be able to put it back out through that bottom hole with that. It's actually made difficult by the fact that everything is black. And I can't see what I'm doing. There we are. And your lace should be a tight enough fit in those holes. Those are um, number six size holes, which I don't remember if that's three sixteenths. Sounds right. Um, set some ho revolvers in there. This can pop over the hammer. It doesn't necessarily need to be super tight. But if you tight enough, the revolver can't be pulled back out easily, so it won't fall out on its own. But you can still pop that off the hammer pretty easily when you need to get to the firearm. And that's pretty much it.